Hello, this is another 3D Total Podcast. My name is Paul Hellard. This morning I spoke with Max Ulichny, a passionate art director, illustrator, storyteller, and, well, let's just call him a creator. He's worked for the longest time with A52 and Elastic Studios, and last year he left to pursue many projects he's wanted to pursue for a long time. He worked on the 3D Total book called The Beginner's Guide to Digital Painting in Procreate, available right now to order from the site. But he also has his own digital book out, filled with his incredible artwork. He's several active commissions right now, and he's also produced digital brushes for Procreate and a very popular batch he calls Max Packs. And this project has totally turned his fortune around. His story is incredible, and the depth of his knowledge is obvious. Have a listen. Welcome, Max Ulichny, to the 3D Total podcast. Um, thanks for uh, coming up and um, having a chat. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate uh, you know being on. <laughs> you've you've been an art director, illustrator, uh, and now brush mancer. You call yourself <laughs> brush mancer, yeah, yeah, of uh, Max Packs. Uh, That's for, right for Procreate. Uh, you've you've turned your career around uh, in the most delightful way. Um, and uh, you've you've tapped into a vein of um, well, uh, an immense uh, riches of of um, people interested in using your brushes. And you have a, a book coming out fairly soon online, uh, the they Art do. of Max Ulichny, Volume One. I love mm -hmm. that Volume One because there's more to come. It's tell kind me... of a promise to me to make more in the future. <laughs> That's awesome. Can you tell yeah. me a little about that, and we'll get on. Yeah. Um, so I, the, the book, um, so I did Lightbox last year, um, and I had done CTN the year before that. Um, and it was, I'd wanted to make a book for CTN and, uh, just ran out of time. It was enough just to do the, do the event. Yeah. Um, and then for Lightbox, I had, um, well, you know, we'll get into my career a little bit, but I, I had that summer I had, uh, quit my staff job. And so I had time to put together things like that, you know, the things that would, have previously been hard to put together, harder to put together, given the circumstances. Um, without a day job, I had all this time to give real attention to my book, um, give more attention to brushes and um, just kind of community aspects and sort of, um, and also just rest too. It's not like I was just filling it all with time, but it was the, uh, or, you know, with, with projects. But um, yeah, the book kind of came together for a light box and did surprisingly well. So I was really, um, really thrilled. It sold out at Lightbox. Um, I, I made, you know, more than I thought I would sell. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. just so that I could maybe take it next year or something. Mm. Um, but it turned out that it did shockingly well. And so, uh, and sold out in just over two days. So of a three day event. That's so true. the, uh, yeah, thank you. And so the, the book is going online. It just hit my distributor. So we've got to, um, just click a couple buttons and, sign a couple things and we're off to the races to to purchase online and then it'll be available internationally hopefully it, that you know you know it gives me more reach and it's also being sold in um galleries in la gallery nucleus and at uh q pop in little tokyo yeah tell hopefully me more um, well, yeah when you say international distribution are you have you translated some of it or is that necessary or uh, it's basically just all pictures with the exception of a bio at the end um i i kind of wanted this to be well part of it is it's self-published, um, so it's not as if um, I'm trying to do tutorials or anything else like that in okay. this. Um, I have video tutorials coming out soon, so I was like, it seems silly to put too much of that in this book, and it was also a matter of time. You know, it's a matter of getting things printed, and it's my first book, so it probably took me longer than, <laughs> than it needed to. Sure. Um, but it was just enough to get it done under the deadline, and uh, it's pretty packed. It's 90-something pages of, of just strictly art from the last... I don't know, roughly five years or something like that. So it's it's condensing a lot of my uh, my progress into one place. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, we'll keep it simple, we'll keep it focused on the art. Yeah, on all personal work, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of um, professional, like there's some procreate commissions in there, in fact, um, which I have permission to to use for this. Yeah. But it was um, I've done some work with them, and they're essentially they just want what I do naturally. So I felt it was you know not exactly like art director or, or in that sense, it was very, some, you know, it's basically just my work. So it didn't feel like I, it would be weird to, to post. Your, your words and your guidance 
in the other book, the uh, 3D Total Publishing book uh, called The Beginner's Guide to Digital Painting in Procreate, um, was a bit of a nod to the best techniques of traditional uh, media. Can you yeah. talk about that? What's What, what was the direction there? Yeah, I, um, through art school and since, um, I've tried to keep traditional work as a you know, a backbone of my work in many ways. And making digital brushes, a lot of what I'm doing, of course, is trying to uh, replicate traditional media. That's sort of the thing that I'm, that's sort of the core of my brush philosophy, I suppose. You know, it's easy enough to make um, unusual kind of out there digital brushes, but that wasn't really where my heart was at. So I wanted to make, you know, replicas of things that I enjoy using traditionally. And so that's been sort of the, the, the point is to kind of keep it all of a piece, um, make sure that I'm enabling um, the ability to make traditional style art digitally if you so choose, or you can also use the brushes to do whatever the heck you want with them. But at least you have the, you know, the base ability to, if this looks like, it gives, it gives I think, the user an expectation of a medium. So if it's, a, if it's called gouache, then you kind of expect it to lay down like gouache. Or if it's called watercolor, you expect it to lay down like watercolor. But of course, it's digital. Yeah. You can break the rules. And so um, the tutorial was sort of my way of thinking of like, here's how I'm approaching it, you know, with all the benefits of digital, but also trying to get the aesthetic of traditional work and get the warmth and the the texture uh, that comes with it. Because I think in the, in the case of the piece in the book, it's sort of 70s, 80s, it's inspired. Um, it's kind of like hand-me-down older brother's records it's like a kid listening like jamming on air guitar to his older brother's records yeah like after school or something I and so it. it feels like it's something that needs a bit of warmth and texture and um, nostalgia to it and i think if it was like coldly digital doesn't mean it would make any worse of a piece but i think there's something to the the sense of having a tactile surface that just takes it a little bit further that feels right for the piece and that's kind of the thing that i tend to do with a lot of my brushes it, it allows you to sort of match the medium to the the theme of what you're trying to create yeah yeah the different grades of uh, paper and uh, the supple surface textures working again from the the top down you're talking about the particular kind of brush uh, surface or texture as well yeah it has a bit of a subliminal effect it, yeah. it you know it filters in in a way that you're not necessarily explicitly aware of, but it feels nice yeah you know yeah. that's that sounds like a, a perfect place to gravitate because it's it's more tactile it's 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 very mm -hmm. organic isn't it yeah it is it's something i like in my work i like a bit of a messy edge i like a little bit of um it, you know when i was younger I, I used to like ink my work for example and it would get kind of cold and dead because it lost something of the energy of the marks from my pencil the scratchiness of the pencil so i was like well, i want something that has <laughs> a bit more warmth to it a little bit more energy to it without me having to work so hard to get it and part of that is approach and part of that is the brushes yeah. So it's um yeah it all kind of works to support that goal. It's just to have some some extra vibrance to the work. Mm, mm. I'd love you to um if if briefly uh, tell us about your time at A fifty two and Elastic. I mean you spent almost yeah. almost fifteen years in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my adult life has yeah. been spent there basically. Um, yeah, I, I went there straight out of school. Um, I grew up in Ohio. I went to I, I interned at um, ad agencies in Ohio since I was 16 to 23. And so um, in commercial, you know, like having an advertising background helped me find work. It felt like a, like it, w it wasn't a huge complete leap of industry um, to, to come to LA and land in CG. That was the goal is to do visual effects. And um, growing up, I always wanted to do like, um, you know, monster makeup and special effects and things yeah. like that, you know, really affected by movies like Jurassic Park and, and you know, all the great uh, practical effect movies and stuff that That's right. um, as well leading up to that. Anyway, so that, coming out to L.A., I was like, this feels like a great stepping stone. You know, like this is the little that I know the stepping stone would be a career. But at the time, it was like, this feels like I have some some anchor to this because of advertising. Um it was a small studio when I first started. It was only A52 um, and Rock, Paper, Scissors. They're sister companies. So Rock, Paper, Scissors came first. It's an editorial company. Yeah, yeah. Um, so A52 um, was really welcoming to me at the time as a young artist. We were a small studio, about 30 people. Um, and it meant I got to really get my hands dirty in a lot of different aspects of creation. And I really enjoyed that. I was 
in my mind when I left school, I wanted to be an animator and what I ended up doing was very different. And that was because um, mentors like Andy Hall at A52 and uh, he's still at Elastic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, we spun off Elastic because we were doing extra creative work and we were directing and we were doing all these um, more art directed kind of, you know, artistic pieces that didn't quite fit the mold of, of a visual, a visual effects company. Okay. So um, I ended up moving from like modeling and lighting to concept art and art direction and directing ultimately. Um, so I've kind of run the gamut, you know, bet- from, from, you know, year one <laughs> and in 2005, I was, um, you know, just a beginner who kind of was just like, didn't really know what he wanted to do with his career, but it felt like a good studio to explore it in to, by the time I left last, uh, July in, um, you know, 2019, I was directing and art directing and, uh, supervising and things. And it was really, um, I think a credit to people with vision who allowed me to experiment and to grow myself as an artist and, give that back to the company, you know, just as much as they, as they gave to me. So I think it was a really great experience. Um, it was hard to leave. It was really yeah. hard to leave after four and a half years. That's a, I mean, it felt like, it honestly felt like graduating. It felt like when I left for LA, that's how it felt. It felt like moving away from home. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's been funny. Cause like, you know, I left, the whole plan was to leave to do studio work, um, like animation work. Uh, hopefully, you know, the goal was to aim for, you know, like, Disney or DreamWorks or Netflix or something to that effect, or Warner oh, Brothers. Yeah. Um, and the way and the brushes had success that was that I was not expecting. And so since then I've been um, just li- <laughs> living off of the brushes and and also of course things like 3D Total, the the, the book that we made and um, and some other um, tutorials that I've written for other magazines. Uh, that that's been sort of. I've been able to take on projects with that kind of time. That's been really um, exciting and it's been uh, refreshing. You know, after 14, 14 and a half years at a studio, you kind of need a little bit of difference just to feel like you're still growing. Um, and also, you know, it's, it wasn't the easiest job, you know, just as any uh, visual effects job isn't easiest. It, it tends to be an industry that requires a lot from its people. And so it's yeah. been nice to have a bit of a break and a little bit of a, you know, space to, be a better rounded person and not give it all to work. You know? Yeah, yeah, and and just get a little bit more oxygen into your brain so you can be, become more creative, which is the, the goal exactly. in the end for everyone. Yeah, it gives you a little bit, a little bit of time to travel and learn and um, just change the channel, get yeah. a little space, learn to cook, and you know, just kind of you know, just do some of the things. It's hard to find the time to do otherwise. That's awesome. Tell me, okay, um, you're still working in the commercial industry every now and again. You do still get commissions elsewhere, and I see yeah, you're, you're mixing, you're mixing your work, as you said, uh, editorial. Yeah. You're you're doing various jobs in various sectors. Is yeah. that is that a, a perfect mix or? It's funny. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the right balance is for me. I think that's true of anybody, really, anybody's career. I, I have the the privilege of of not needing the jobs to pay the bills necessarily for, you know, because of the brushes. Um, and so I'm just taking on things with clients that I enjoy working with. Um, and that's really an incredible uh, situation to be in. It's never, it was never the plan when this whole thing launched and I know it's not going to last forever too. So I'm enjoying it while it lasts. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So like, I think I'd like to still be involved creatively with different people. I want to collaborate. I want to learn. I want to, be in the room with artists and um, and do fun things and I, you know it kind of depends on what the project is. Um, like it, for example, I just had an interview with Netflix that went well and hopefully will uh, it'd be interesting to collaborate with them. So I'd love to you know I think shorter bookings for now at least feel good. After 14 and a half years, I'm not ready to for a long term uh, project. I think yeah. you know if the right one comes along, we'll see and I'll definitely consider it. There there are certainly a few. Uh, clients who could come say hi and I'd probably drop everything to work with them. Um, but, uh, you know, like I've been working with Procreate and they're lovely to work with. And of course, you know, we have a strong relationship. They're just kind of, you know, friendly. We love to work with each other. So that's been really fantastic. Like they flew me down to, uh, to Tasmania to come see them and spend and to live stream with them and stuff and met them at Lightbox last year. And everybody's, it's, it's like, it's like friends you never knew you had until you meet them and you're like, Oh, we're just like, we're cool. Right. This is great. Um, (laughs) so it's nice to work with them and, 
you know, different publications. It's been, it's been really fun. It's been a good balance where I get to, um, you know, get a little outside influence, a little bit of, uh, projects that are, wouldn't, I wouldn't normally do for myself, but, sure. um, you know, mix it up and, and still get to work with people. Tell me, tell me a bit more about, uh, Savage Interactive, Dan and Hobart, uh, the bottom mm -hmm. of Australia. They're the Australia's best kept secret in the tech yeah. world. Uh, they developed yeah. Procreate for those listening. Um, and I spoke with um, uh, Georgie and uh, have linked up with James Cooter, the CEO. Yeah. Um, tell me about them. And since you've been down there, uh, t t tell us about their kit. Oh, man, uh, their facilities are amazing. Uh, I, I swear they're one of the most interesting companies I've ever uh, come in contact with in some ways. They, just the people are absolutely lovely. I think most of them are locals or well, I mean, certainly they have to live in Tasmania. It's not exactly an easy commute otherwise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I, I think many of them are native uh, Tasmanians. I think um, the uh, it, it, I think it seems to be like just a, one of those beautiful situations. And they could obviously speak to this better than I could. But I think just the people that they have there are all so warm, so lovely. Um, and I think you can see it in the product. I think Procreate is just one of those few um, programs where it just feels really clever and streamlined in a way that you just don't see often. Um, and I think that's a credit to a small, tight, like really collaborative team who seem to just enjoy working with each other. Um, the, the spirit of the place is just like really, I don't know, excited to do what they're doing. They seem to really be very proud of the product they're making. And man, they just, they respond so well to the community. Um, and just, you know, the thing of, of just like flying people down just the live stream because they, can is so welcoming and, and generous because you know you could do digital live streams too and i've done that with them as well um okay. yeah. but uh it's been really fantastic to to have a to just to, to meet a great collaborator especially you know because they don't have to be cool <laughs> they can make a great project and product and not be awesome to work with but they happen to be lovely and i think it shows i think the product is that good because of them yeah there's a certain simplicity from the surface but uh that uh that application, once it's uh, open and ready to go on uh, on the iPad, uh, I've <laughs> my jaw keeps dropping because I can mm -hmm. you can peel away those onion onion skins and, and get down yeah. right down deep into the tech if you really wanted to. It's yeah. uh, it's an amazing. It's deeper piece than it appears on the surface. I think it's Absolutely. it's one of those things where there's you can really push it more than it seems. If you if you just kind of doodle on the surface, it's still good, but it, it's hiding secrets if you if you. Uh, if you want to invest it, it it's much more clever than it first lets on yeah I'd, i'll do a little shout out here because the uh uh the book the beginner's guide to digital painting and procreate is such uh, uh an introduction yes but it it, it dives deep as well um mm -hmm. they've got uh five or six artists giving uh looking at the the use of uh procreate on on the ipad from different angles from different areas uh, colors, composition, uh, your your run through, uh, looking at the work in the traditional traditional media, um, with composition and and your talk about um, character motivations and storytellings goes a little bit little bit deeper again on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, now, talking of going a little deeper, I'm I want to direct this into how you develop your brushes because when you're devising a new brush do you focus on the effect on the tip of the canvas and work back from there or do you build it from the back so to speak like in code do you look do you think technical or do you stay artistic you know I, I think my philosophy it's funny I it comes from I think a lot of my skill in brush making comes from reverse engineering reality for CG in yeah. some ways yeah you know you, you're kind of it is reverse engineering. I, I want this kind of mark, you know, or in the case of like CG, you're like, I oh, you need to make a photo real car and you have to like work back from all the choices that come from that. First, you have to, you know, get a car model and then you have to, you know, put the right materials on it and uh -huh. find the lighting for it and that kind of thing. In this case, it's, you know, I want this kind of mark and, and there, there, I have a bit of a kind of a simplified tutorial brush making in the book. Uh -huh. Um, and it's, it's more about, um, that's kind of more of a top down approach, but behind the scenes, what I'm thinking of is I want kind of a scratchy mark that has visible bristles because that gives you energy and this character is moving. So I want a little bit of looseness and I want a little bit of scratchiness and, and bristliness just to give it um, a little bit of like transparency between marks and, and it's um, 
and that gives you um, that sort of nostalgic texture, which I liked. Um, yeah. And so in this case, it was like, okay, so that means I need to work these dials <laughs> backwards to achieve something that, you know, like when you tilt the brush, it kind of does a dry brush effect, right? Uh -huh. So you can get an effect where it's just like you would expect um, intuitively in a, in a real brush. So hopefully those kinds of things are what I'm, you know, you want to be able to kind of understand a brush very quickly when you pick it up. And there's something, there's sort of just a feel to that. And I think that's sort of an experience thing to an extent. But, you know, the effect is that like I'm looking at some of my favorite like gouache painters or something like that. Mm. And then I'm trying to find, okay, I want that type of mark and I want the brush to do as much as it can do. Um, you know, I don't want to just have to switch brushes for every different kind of mark I want to make. I want to get a variety of marks from one brush if possible. Yeah. So that's kind of the overall goal mostly, you know? Yeah. Um, so I tend to, I tend to follow a lot of traditional artists in order to get ideas for the kinds of things that I need. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tell me, is there a a randomization area where you can get into? Yeah, you want that dry dry effect when you tilt the the stylus, but not all the time. Is that? Um, it, <laughs> um, I think you would just choose not to tilt in those cases. Um, I try to. It, it also yeah. depends on the on the marks that I'm or on on the paper grains that I'm using. Sometimes they they do add a bit of chaos to the process so it's not just if you always tilt the same way you'll always get the same effect because mm. you know like especially if you're hatching on a pencil or doing repetitive marks for whatever reason you don't want each one to look digitally perfect and mm. so there are some little tricks you can do to get something more natural looking um and it is honestly just fiddling with dials it's so unsexy it's so just very like analytical and nerdy and testing it's just a ton of like experimenting and testing and branching off experiments to say oh this is cool but it's not quite what i was going for and then branch off to make another brush that hopefully that gets closer and the more you branch off maybe you've made five brushes in the meantime that are like that's usable or it can be tweaked to make something better than than it was but you know it is very it's kind of a weird blind process it's it's very much like feeling around in the dark until you find something and you're like okay that's it that's what i was trying to make yeah and then from yeah. then on it can be directable yeah yeah, yeah. And, and the more experience i have the, the more direct it is but you know, still, like especially these watercolor brushes that I just made, man, that that's a that's a very hard watercolor means so many different things to so many different people, and it's hard to really know what they're thinking of when they say watercolor, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so I was put I was polling watercolorists and artists who do this frequently, and everybody has a different kind of idea in their head because they use it differently. Yeah. Um. And so like that was a big challenge, but I learned a lot in the process of that one. So this... hopefully I can apply that in the future. My my parents uh, work with watercolor, mm -hmm. and uh, months ago, looking at them work, they'd work with gravity. Obviously, if you yeah. get a, a certain amount of water, uh, water in the brush, and the effect would be exactly what they wanted to come out on the canvas. But how do you do that digitally? I think um, in the case of the brushes, it's funny that the difference the biggest difference between digital watercolors, at least in Procreate, mm. um, if you look at things like Adobe Fresco, that has like a live wet yeah. uh, paint engine in it, which is very interesting. Um, I think, uh, personally speaking, I think it's a, it's a cool piece of tech that doesn't quite match the, the end result of watercolor, but it does some of the middle action of watercolor, which is very cool. And it is something that is impressive but for my sake I, you know without having that in procreate i'm a procreate brush maker because i choose to use procreate yeah. um the most and so you know because that's always there if you want to use their engine go ahead and use their brushes it's there for you um, but in my case i wanted watercolors in procreate and so um i'm sort of <laughs> with you know the act of gravity or the act of bleeding i have to try to get that in that's like an evolution of a mark in watercolor, right? You, that's right. The way watercolor is, it's kind of unexpected. You have mm -hmm. to sort of, you put a mark down and you watch it evolve. Mm -hmm. In the case of me, I'm trying to get to the end point first. So I'm trying to get to the end result. Instead of like watercoloring, you're painting A and getting B. In my case, I'm trying to paint B directly, more yeah. or less, yeah. which is a different way of thinking. And so it does take some understanding of, real watercolor to get a realistic effect because you're still layering you're still doing some of these things but then you're also kind of cheating because you can't do the wet blending so you have to like sort of plan maybe a step or two ahead and say okay i'm going to put this mark down knowing that i have to then like 
you know, lock the alpha and then paint a different color in to get a two color bleed. Yeah. Um, and so the, the idea isn't to put down red on one side and put down blue on the other and let them blend like you would with real watercolor. You're going to maybe just throw it on the red, lock the alpha and then, you know, paint blue on the other side and you get the same effect. You know, yeah. you get something that's 99% similar and it's like, but it's completely controllable. It's not going to move. It's not going to do unexpected things. You don't have to keep undoing and redoing. So to me, it's, it's, kind of the best of both worlds mm -hmm. you get to make the mark that you expect and it's not going to drift off where you didn't want it to or yeah. things like that so i think you know it's the best thing you can do in procreate i think and i think the response seems to agree so i hope uh hope people have been happy with the brushes yeah yeah i mean a wet blend is almost like a digital directable gradient uh mm -hmm. where you know that final result talking of colors um the, where's that connection setting in the brush where the tip of the brush meets the color requests in the application um there are, there's color dynamics in the new procreate brush engine so i have some control over things like um what would you call it it's kind of hue uh, and value um variation yeah. or sometimes and you can do like two color brushes so that said, you know, that red and blue example, you can actually paint red and, you know, if you make a kind of a foreground and a background color or primary, secondary color, hmm. you can pick those two colors and use pressure to blend between them. It works pretty well. Yeah. Um, and I've used it uh, on occasion to great effect. It's not my go-to brush, but it's a fun thing to, you know, wash a background with or, um, you know, for kind of a good special effect. It's a, it's a fun little trick. Yeah, yeah. Now that's a, that's a perfect segue because you have a lot of brushes. Can you describe I do. I do have some? A lot now. <laughs> Can you describe your favorite? <laughs> I know oh, that's this is a so tough hard. One. It's so hard. Well, you know, because it changes too. Like I end up using yeah. the, the latest pack a lot for marketing purposes, but also because mm. they're fresh and they're fun. Um, it's funny. I don't have go-to brushes because of that. I don't have like this is my one brush. But I would say like of my inkers, like kind of ink brushes. I, there's a two. There's like an ink, uh, a liner and a. Um, a fountain pen in the new watercolor pack that I'm really fond of. The liner is kind of my version of a Shiyun Kim inker. Okay. Um, or, you know, you can kind of use both of them that way, but it's a little toothy. That's a very popular Photoshop brush that's out there. And of course, you can import Photoshop brushes too in Procreate. I don't know why I'm promoting that. I want you to buy my brushes. But um, I, you know, it's a popular brush, but I think it's, it. I can recognize it a mile away. It's a good one, but it looks kind of digital. It, um, and so I wanted my own version that was a little bit more natural, a little bit less um, recognizable. So I, that was my goal with the liner was to to get something kind of similar to that. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of breaks up when, you know, when you put light pressure on and it just looks delicate in a way that his brush does. But it's it's on it's its own thing entirely, but it has that kind of spirit behind it. Sure. Um, and then there's a an, um, toothy inker from my comics pack that I'm really fond of that I keep going back to that feels like a kind of a pocket brush, like a you know, pencil pocket brush. That's that comics pack was sort of my me, re, me recreating my toolkit for my yeah. sketchbook, you know, so I could like take my moleskin and take my, my, you know, my pencils and my pens. And that's kind of that pack in one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then in terms of there's an, there's an acrylic, uh, like a chunky acrylic, like a wet chunky acrylic, I think it's called that uh, in, in the painters pack that I'm really fond of still. I use that occasionally. Sure. And the, the gouache pack, I think, is my desert island pack, though. If I had to only use one, that seems to have the most range. And it's um, it's got one of my favorite pencils in it. There's a really great um, 600 series pencil that's inspired, inspired by a Blackwing pencil that okay. I really love. So it's kind of, you know, it's a long answer because, I, you know, that's I make great. so many. And uh, but yeah, I think those that's my short list, it seems. These are yeah. your these are your digital brushes and, and pencils and and points. Yeah. How about your analog? Do you still own an analog block of um, uh, pad and pencil and uh, brushes? I do. I do. I, you know, it's fine. I don't use it as much as I'd like. Um, it's. I, I still love them, but there's there's a sense that I should be working with my product to sell my product. You know, and it's yeah. it's a it's a funny bit of calculus. It's also that like I enjoy my brushes i i use them and i make them because i love them um but i do i have i usually work in a moleskin i think it's what four by six or whatever the kind of medium standard size is mm. um and uh i tend to use uh like black wings or or some kind of similar soft lead pencils and 
uh, pocket brushes and some sometimes markers. I have a like a diluted India ink um, water brush to do like gray tones. That's pretty common. Or I have like some monolith pencils uh, that I really like. They're kind of all lead. They're really fat and you can they're very soft lead and you can smudge them with your finger. So you almost get like kind of a graphite. Charcoal. Yeah. Yeah, or excuse me, almost like a charcoal effect. Yeah, mm. that's right. So it that's really fun. Yeah. Um, something I just picked up actually in Hobart um, is a uh, it's a what is it art graph? It's um, yep. water soluble graphite, which is really fun. So it almost lays down like like a gray tone ink, but yeah. you can erase it and smudge it around a little bit. I love but that. it goes down kind of like a really grainy uh, watercolor effect. It's interesting. It just it's unlike anything I've used before. But I've I've been having fun with that. What you, what's your advice for for those of us who uh, have to work from home for uh, those uh, virus reasons? Not that you would have it, but just to keep away from it. Um, what sure. sort of advice? What sort of advice would you give to our entire industry uh, working from home? Because there are a lot of us, obviously, now listening. Yeah. Well, in, you know, even with virus aside, I think there's a lot of people making you know, comics or illustrations and things, freelance work from from home. Uh, it's kind of a new thing for me, honestly, and it's taken some getting used to for myself. Um, the uh, One of the things that I made sure to do is establish a routine as much as possible. And it's I'm not always great at it and I can always improve, but I, you know, make sure I'm like, I get up at the same time I used to basically for my, for my staff job, you know, so I, I set an alarm every morning. Um, I shower get dressed put shoes on even just to like it makes me feel like i'm in work mode and i'm not just lazing around in my pajamas or whatever and you know and so it feels like i'm in my best shape to work and it kind of focuses my mind you know i'm trying to eat at the same time as i'm trying to do that kind of thing and that structure has been important to me i think it's really easy when i would take a break um like take a vacation while i was working my staff job i would frequently kind of you know not do much in my weekends and kind of forget to eat and just not really. And, you know, you look up and it's two and you haven't done anything with the day. And it's like this time I'm trying to really be mindful of my time and make the most of a precious resource. You know, this is opportunity cost cost. The, uh, the time that we have is time that we could be making art or being, or doing something productive. That's, you know, counter to art that makes us feel uh, healthier mentally in more well-rounded ways as well. So like I've been trying to cook, more i've been trying to um i've been learning how to make cocktails because that's kind of a fun thing you can do for yourself in the middle of the day as long as you're not abusing it and not getting any work done of course of course but it's been fun like diving into a little subculture and learning some new techniques and that's been really uh, exciting for me so i think you know everything in moderation you want to make sure that you're still focused on your work of course but like if you can kind of make it feel special i think that's cool too so i've been also going to the gym um and trying to just be a well-rounded person and i think that structure has helped me to not just like go down a spiral of of uh, sort of self-serving, just doodling for no reason, um, or or just you know whiling away the day without focus. Of course, things like the gym uh, or or you know social activities are tricky at the at the explicit moment we're in right now with the virus. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, you know, one thing at a time. We we can at least do the things we can control and and uh, at least sort of act like we're still uh, uh, in control of our, our, our days and get dressed and do some work. Are you thinking along the lines, perhaps in the future, I'm not sure, for these brushes to be used in Mari, the 3D paint and texture tool from Foundry? Uh, oh, interesting. Into that 3D realm of painting textures or painting anything. That would be very interesting. It's I'll be honest, it's not something that I'd really considered... Um, before I I've painted in 3D to an extent yeah. uh, or done like two and a half D uh, animated pieces. Mm. I think a lot of the better tools for that were coming around as I was more in the art directing space and less um, less like the artist on the box making the actual art uh, or you mean you know, actually you know spending all my day on the computer. So a lot of it is concept art and then leading the team and managing and taking my own shots and some of that stuff. But I'll be honest, like from a technical perspective or a software perspective there are new tools coming around that I, I just never really spent a significant time to learn to uh to do real painting and i you know a little bit um like substance was was becoming uh popular as uh over the last few years at a5 tune elastic as it is everywhere and as also as they made their tool more 
suitable for proper CG production rather than just game work. But it's a really interesting, exciting tool in many ways. But it's also, I think, some of the old tricks still work. You know, maybe I'm an old dog now, it seems. Um, But just like simple projections get the job done a lot of the time. And and it's not that hard to fix things in Photoshop. But, you know, like project, bake, and, and, you know, retouch is kind of easy. I think a lot of the time um, young artists are attracted to new shiny tools that they're very sophisticated, but they don't have the basis for the old efficient maybe slightly clunky but quicker ways and so they kind of overcomplicate right off the bat because the tools are cool and they let you overcomplicate but it's like you know sometimes you can just throw a procedural thing on something and it works <laughs> you know or you know you can make kind of a funny network uh and like you know i we used to a, a f2 elastic was, was a maya and cinema shop yeah and i used maya and yeah. so like you know you, you use hypershade to like kind of make these big funny graphs that you could um throw on kind of like whatever and it would look pretty good out the box instead of having to go into substance and like heavily texture each individual piece yeah this is a bit of a a tangent but i i I think that kind of applies to the sake of 3d um painting and i i'm in fact i'm i just ordered my uh my vr kit (laughs) to get half-life alex (laughs) so i'm excited but i'm also excited i was about to pull the trigger before they even announced that because i wanted to use things like tilt brush and um and uh i'm blanking on the alternative one yeah yeah. um but i'd really love to try painting in three dimensions i think that stuff looks really exciting so i'd like to to learn a few of those techniques i think it seems like a, a fun um fun goal to to just change up the tools i did a story with uh some guys at disney uh interactive Mm -hmm. and their entire studio was uh, this kit of vr they were painting everything around them it was uh, phenomenal to watch Um, i think there's something really exciting for filmmaking like cross-section of painting and filmmaking there that's really kind of thrilling and a little scary because it's like it is a it's a frontier that nobody really quite understands yet and i'm thrilled to to see where that goes um it's like a cooking glass all these yeah yeah you got things planned for the night? Or are you going to have a, a lazy night in? Um, I, at the moment, I'm trying. To, there's a um, a character arena challenge put on by T M Wilson on Instagram. Oh, uh, okay. he's a really talented uh, character designer, and he's doing this. It's due tonight, in fact. There's a um, he's doing. It's like an imaginary fighting game, like Smash Brothers or Street Fighter or something like that. Um, and everybody, it's geared towards artists to create a fighter. And so I'm I'm creating this insane. It sounds so stupid when I say it out loud, but it's it's like a Shaolin uh, jazz trombonist fighter. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, yeah, okay. so it's um, kind of silly and um, it's it's kind of cracking me up. So it's just it's a way to kind of work the muscles and and play with the craft, but also like have a laugh and and you know participate in a little uh, social art. That's that's challenge. tremendous. That's yeah. that's also another leg of a leg to the um, living online thing. Uh, you're staying healthy. Yeah. You're staying creative. And you're uh, you're getting out, sort of being social in whatever silly way this is. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay then, I'll I'll get on with my day and I'll I'll leave you to it. But thanks again, Great. and I'll I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Paul. Bye bye.